there. So what we're gonna cover is just some background information. What are the signs of financial abuse, which are on that one handout page? Where then we're gonna go into having, how do you have this conversation? Because depending on the stage of where they're at, sometimes it's an easier conversation, sometimes it is very difficult. It can be a very challenging conversation to how to help them with their finances. Then also the steps of prevention, which is on the back side of that page for you to take away. And then some final things on next steps to take um, as you work through this process. Most of these people that we run into, they tend to be in their 80s. Women are twice as likely to be victimized from this, and we'll cover a couple of details while that's the case. Most of the people are living alone. So part of this, uh, some of the fraudulent acts going on is, um, happens because of loneliness. They, they want to visit with people. They want to connect with people. So they tend to be more likely to this event. Also, it, it requires, uh, it happens when there's some level of home health care, assisted care, something going on. There's more caregiving required now for this person. Uh, the statistics then on the right side up there is from the Journal of Internal Medicine study that was done on this. Uh, there's also a media study that was done on this, a little bit different results, but from the Journal of Internal Medicine, since we're at Des Moines University, so we can pull on some medical statistics here, is about 58% of the perpetrators are from family. And whether they feel it's a right they have because they're providing the care, uh, there's just lack of knowledge, that, from that study tends to be the percentage. Friends and neighbors, 17%. Uh, home care aides at 15%, and then other events is 10%. And that could be other outside uh, criminal elements preying on the elderly. There's $17 billion lost each year to this exploitation. So it is a, it's a big issue from this study, uh, from the TrueLink financial study a couple years ago, two-thirds is due to financial or criminal fraud. A lot of people say, well, this isn't going to happen to me. I'm educated. I'm, I'm pretty uh, up on things. And yet what shows is that they're more comfortable moving large sums of money around uh, because of their sophistication and education. So when they make an error, it tends to be a very large error. So way beyond this 36000 uh, a great investment opportunity, a, a great approach, new business, and all of a sudden they, they lose hundreds of thousands and not millions of dollars. If somebody's at home by their, themselves, uh, whether they've already lost a spouse or not. But now, uh, if they tend to be more extroverted, and they like socializing, uh, they tend to give people the benefit of the, adult, of the doubt, and they have about four times as much loss to financial elder abuse as other people. Uh, so if you're skeptical, I guess at times that works out okay. But you got to dig in and, and ask questions and bring in other people. And so the reason I showed our firm and, and talking about having done this dozens of times, the theme of today is this. One, there's a lot of good information out there and we have to seek it. So I'm gonna help share with you the sources of knowledge available. Two, it's the collaboration. So I'm a financial planner, I'm not a physician, I can't talk about the, the medical side of this, I'm not an attorney, there's some legal sides of this that, that have to be addressed but also as the financial planner working with people and their money, we see this, we, we looked at how do you work through it, both in good and bad situations. And so it's that collaboration among all these different people, the, the caregivers, uh, the, the person, if they're mentally competent, their involvement in this discussion, the attorney, the tax preparer, the financial planner, the physicians, all these people working together, and that takes communication. So you're starting to see these signs. And, and again, it's now being observant, having the conversations, recognizing those subtle changes, and as they progress over the time. Children that have intermittent contact tend to see the, the changes more dramatically because they're not in daily, weekly contact. So as you progress over time, it's tougher to change until all of a sudden something's like, what is going on here? Um, where somebody, a child coming in occasionally goes, Wow, they're repeating themselves a lot. They're bringing up the same story a lot. Okay, those are some of the, the signs. N knowing who they talk to or see is real critical. And, and having those conversations, setting it up, keep having the conversations, 
you know, visiting homes, seeing what's piling up, is, is something not being maintained, which they normally did. Prevention is how to pay attention to those signs and then knowing what's available in your community. I mean, the, the work being done here with, with Calvin Community, Des Moines University, you know, the Alzheimer's Association, uh, all these groups working together are resources because again, for most of us, this is our first time dealing with it. The discussion's about to occur and, and a couple of this tougher discussions is you gotta come from it as, as a loving child or a spouse and how to start having the discussion. You, it, it's about as tough as giving up the right to drive the car. Uh, I mean, our, we've grown up in a pre-independent society and having the, the discussion with a parent, uh, you know, we, need, we need to have you stop driving by yourself. And that's a tough one also because of that independence. Uh, that probably bothered some of our clients more than having somebody kind of take over the bill paying and the management. But it, it's just talking through that scenario of, of th those decisions are tough. And it's kind of like, and you kind of reverse the, the, the situation. It's kind of like the parent talking to the child saying, you're making some bad decisions here. Well, you've got to change that language. You've got to try to come from a loving standpoint of we want to make sure you have enough resources to last your lifetime. And to do that, can we set up some safeguards to make sure people aren't taking advantage of you? It's changing some of that language out there. Uh, Crucial Conversations is a book that helps with those, those difficult emotional-based conversations, Crucial Conversations. Um, because, it, it, you know, depending on where the person's at, where they can be at. The worst case we had is a client that wouldn't sign any of these documents we talked about, would not sign a power of attorney, would not sign the authority to release information of their children, would not sign the uh, anticipating uh, incapacity. And so, and they had uh, a progressive disease, you would ask a question and it would be four to, literally four to five minutes before we get an answer. And that's a long time to sit there in silence, letting them try to process it through. Brought the attorney in, we could not get the attorney to agree to take it to court to rule them you know, incapable, okay? Or then go to the physician. So we were in a tough spot. It was a second marriage uh, and we were in a tough spot and now they're not handling their finances. This person was not handling their finances and the children are coming to us because we have an idea what, what they have and we couldn't share anything, okay? And they'd shut out the second wife from the discussion. Try, and so it was just a mess. And so again, it's, it's trying to address these things before they go too far. It's the same decision as moving into a, a retirement community, assisted living, skilled care, uh, typically assisted living in retirement communities, it is better to make that decision while you're still have the energy and ability to help downsizing, get rid of clutter. You know, it's better to do it while you have the choice than being forced to somebody to choose for you. That's the main distinction here. And it deals the same thing with financial management. It is better to do that while you have some thought, start turning over some of authority, which is scary. And as a financial planner, having done this all my professional life, yeah, it'll be scary if I ever turn over the control of my finances to the kids. So I've got to hopefully train them, start giving them particular aspects to track with while I'm still able to say, okay, are you doing okay with this? Or work with professionals on it also. So that communication is the tough one. There's no doubt about it. The cognitive testing, so everybody's aware of what, where we're at. And, and fortunately, as is getting better. Um, then it's simplifying the matters. You know, we had a client come in with 27 different investment accounts. And we could get them down to about five or six. So again, now just, and, and here's the problem. If somebody's gonna take over finances for somebody else, and they're not a good manager themselves, now you've just at least doubled their load. And just imagine, okay, I'm doing my all my things, you know, keeping check registers and keeping track of where my money's going and looking at where, you know, how my assets and liabilities are doing. And am I on track for enough resources for my lifetime? Um, it's a pretty daunting task. And if I'm not doing it myself and now somebody else is taking it over and let alone figure out where everything's at, that gets pretty tough. So some of it's simplification, consolidation of those different accounts there. 
Then it's the discussion with your family and caregivers of who's going to do what. Once we get, and it's best to have some of this occur ahead of time, but if we have family members or caregivers or professionals agree who's going to do what, who's going to write the checks, who's going to get the bills, who's going to look at it, reconcile it, bring in other family members for verification that this is the right decision. So it's that agreement, and then you can write it out, document those roles. Get agreement on there of who's going to do it if, if we're going to have to take over mom and dad's finances because they, they really can't. Um, it's understanding where all these documents are at. Fortunately, we have a, in the digital age now, we can store most of it electronically. We don't have to keep as much paper now. So we can store things electronically and share it with each other if they do change their will, their medical power of attorney, their durable power of attorney. Um, Investment-wise and bank account-wise, get duplicate statements. If, if there's a number of siblings, share the information with them all so everybody gets a chance to look and nobody's taking advantage of mom and dad, whether it's another sibling doing it or that. And so again, now we have to develop good communication with our siblings. And if we've had relationship struggles before, obviously that gets tough. But that's, we have to, to deal with, with some of that to make sure everybody's comfortable where we're at. When it works, it works well. You know, when the, the mom and dad say, yeah, we need help here, and the kids are communicating well, we bring them in for family meetings, so we get everybody on the same page, we show them essentially the whole financial plan, because mom and dad have given us the authority to do so, and we share all that information. Yeah, they have enough to last their lifetime. Here's some investment changes that we recommend. Here's what we're distributing monthly for them to live on. And son Bill is writing the checks. Okay? So it works out pretty good when, it's, when you've got that cooperation, that collaboration working there. Um, limit account access and balances at banks. So what a couple things these last two on um, this screen is talking about. These now fortunately again with technology, credit cards, bank accounts, investment accounts, you can be notified of some transactions above a certain amount. So on my credit card, if my credit card balance gets to a certain limit, I get a ping. If I have any online purchases, I get a message. So and if it's not my wife or I that did the transaction, I go, I know I have some fraud. I got something going on. I'm going to have that on bank accounts. Again, the draw amounts, balances, investment accounts, get those notifications. And it's whatever the family's comfortable with. Is it $500? Is it $1,000? Is it $5,000? What's the notification on that? And then you can block other large transactions, which are getting wiser and wiser in today's events. And as I talked about, copy everybody in, have people watch the watchers, work with this team out there, and then there's a couple logistical things, uh, specifics we'll talk about. If they're not going to borrow money anymore, and you had heard the Equifax lost 220 million people's personal data, don't worry about that. Criminal elements already have all your personal information. Okay? They already have it. It's just a question of when and how they're going to use it. Okay. So you got to be checking credit reports. If you go out to these agencies, these three agencies, and block and freeze your credit, they can't borrow under your name and social security number. So if they're not going to be borrowing money, go out and freeze their credit. If you have to unfreeze it, yeah, you got to pay $10 to $15 to unfreeze it. But if they're not going to be borrowing it, just shut it down. Uh, then if they go out and all of a sudden try to get their 15th Yonkers card, it won't be issued. Okay. That's the other advantage. Now, obviously our society is more mobile, uh, family's not together, they may not have family, so people go, what do I do? You know, I have children I can trust, I don't have a friend I can trust. Well, then you have to go to a bank, trust department, or what's up here is American Association of Daily Money Managers. Yeah, you're gonna pay a cost for it, but it's probably gonna save you a lot more money than being scammed out of $36,000 occasionally. Yeah. So if, if you need help paying bills, handling some of the administration, um, you have to go to those agencies. A financial planner, if they don't have what's called custodial rights or trustee rights, which we don't, we're not a trust company or a bank, ag bank agency, we cannot take custody of client assets. We cannot write bills for them. Okay? So it takes typically one of these entities to take that over when family's not available. Um, all the solicitations. So I talked about the credit freeze. You can go out also... If somebody's gonna, not going to check their credit report periodically, they can also buy a service. 
you know, you hear about life lock and identity theft shield, and you're gonna pay about $20 a month to automate that system. That system also should turn off uh, credit card solicitations, uh, which again, you can do manually for free. So I give you a list of sites here. If there's a fraud issue, um, if it's a big fraud issue, call your local police, you just report it. The Federal Trade Commission actually has a very good site on fraud. They have a very good consumer site, so the FTC.gov. Um, and then you can go to the credit bureaus, the credit reporting agencies and report it to, and if it's a common scam, the, the um, Secretary of the Iowa Attorney General Office. So I give you that site information so you have the do not call to reduce scams. Again, illegal entities, criminal entities don't care. They're gonna ignore the law that they're not supposed to call you. They're still gonna call. So you, at least you can get off the normal solicitations. Um, the, also the out of, out, um, opt out pre-screen on the mailings, uh, and that's the DM choice. So you can reduce some of the solicitations. So clients like that we know can are not managing affairs, we send it now to their power of attorney or the child that's taken it over. We don't send materials to those clients, it just confuses them. Um, so again, a couple other resources out there. Uh, a good friend of mine developed uh, the system called Wealth Care Plan. So people are saying, okay, I need a process to work through here. Great information, but I'm kind of lost here to be honest. Well, they've developed this whole system. There's a number of states that are setting up more and more elder financial abuse legislation. This system is to help design to work through the process through wealth care plan. There's a lot of good free information on here, but there is a charge then for some of the process to go through. But it's going all the way through the basics. Do you have a medical power of attorney, durable power of attorney, which is financial management designee, wills, you know, Where's your documents stored? Who have you told where they're stored? I mean, all this administrative detail, who knows where your wills are at? My dad died uh, 21 years ago, couldn't find the will. Okay, and they moved out to the West Coast. I called 13 law firms before I finally found a firm he had talked to out in the West Coast. And they said, we talked about it, but we didn't do a new will. I'm well, back to square one. They lived in Omaha, I called up in Omaha, sure enough, the law firm still had the original. Whew, thank goodness. But it took a lot of time and angst because you did not share where the originals were. So where are they at? Where's your lock boxes? Where's all that information? This helps start working through the process to capture all that. 